And we'll now go to Westminster for special coverage on the budget with Andrew Neil. It's budget day here in Westminster, the day of the Johnson government is meant to unveil its new plans for tax and spend, with special emphasis on its new voters in the Midlands and the North. Now, much of that will still happen, but suddenly for a rookie chancellor, only 28 days in the job, the biggest challenge is the growing economic impact of the coronavirus and what he can do to vaccinate the economy from it. With me for this Politics Live budget special, political editor Laura Kunzberg, a business editor Simon Jack and economics editor Faisal Islam. It was supposed to be the levelling up budget designed to help those regions and people who've not done all that well over the past decade. Instead, it looks set to be the coronavirus budget. In a sign of how serious the impact of the virus might be on the economy, as markets were opening this morning, the Bank of England announced a series of emergency monetary measures, including a substantial cut in interest rates. The Bank of England's role is to help UK businesses and households manage through an economic shock that could prove large and sharp. And on the eve of the budget, coronavirus hit Westminster. Health Minister Nadine Dorries is diagnosed with the virus. Are you going to be tested for coronavirus, Minister? It's a dramatic backdrop for any Chancellor delivering a budget, let alone one barely a month into the job. Faisal, let me come to you first, because it seems that the backdrop to this budget now is fear of a serious downturn in the economy perhaps already happening, and longer than one quarter, and not scaremongering, but it, the, the possibility now, if not the probability, that we move into recession. Yeah, large and sharp was the words from uh, Governor Carney there, and that refers to the hit to the economy. Uh, as you refer to, we did some growth numbers out this morning, January, which were already showing the economy uh, flat. So any extra impact in the coronavirus impact on sort of international economy was beginning to be seen in January, uh, coming th uh, thrown through from China. That would have hit the UK economy, but nothing like the hit that we've seen in Europe and now directly in the UK. And it's important to stress that there is the impact of the virus and then there's the impact of trying to contain the virus. And there's a really delicate trade-off between those two factors. But I think you're right to use the R word, and it's exactly why we've had this dramatic emergency action, half a percent off, record... From the joint, bank. From the bank, joint record lows in interest rates. It isn't just about the interest rates, because I think viewers will rightly think, well, hang on, what's an interest rate going to do to make me buy more stuff when I can't leave the house or can't go to work. Uh, so it's in concert with other parts of the toolkit that enable that interest rate to be passed on, overdrafts to keep flowing, working capital to flow, people to be paid uh, through what they hope will be a temporary shock. And it does suggest that what we're going to get from the Treasury will be of equal kind of equal firepower. Well, we shall find out. Laura, uh, danger of a looming recession, not just here, probably in every major economy, certainly Italy maybe Germany too, uh, all chances of competing pressures. But this one has more than most. He's got to outline the big infrastructure programme. He's got to do more on current spending. He's got to keep his new friends in the north happy. He's got to keep the old Tory base in the south happy too. There's a lot of balls in the air at the moment. There certainly are. I mean, it's like juggling water, actually, for <laughs> the new Chancellor, as you say, barely a month into the job. And for this government only a couple of months on since winning what should have been an enormous majority that gave them a little bit of time to sit back think what are our priorities here what are the things we really want to do that is of course pleasing people who voted Tory for the first time either ever or in a long time in parts of the country that aren't their traditional bedrocks of support or how do they pick their political priorities science for example they're very very keen on this government housing they want to do things about that said 
The impact of coronavirus, still the potential impact, which is so unpredictable to know where we'll be in a couple of months, has changed all of that. And this is going to feel, I think, a bit like an emergency budget. You know, this is an economic situation that has changed the complexion of everything that the government is looking at in its first few months in office. And I think we are going to hear some quite dramatic interventions from the Chancellor in terms of that. But they still do not want to give up on their medium to long term aspirations to sort out the lopsided nature of the country as they would see it with a huge cash and a huge big check being promised for big infrastructure. But shiny new projects are not the same. And we'll have to, I'm sure we'll come back to this again and again. Promising shiny new projects is far from the same as reducing the day to day strain on government spending. And Simon, a big change in perspective now for business. Uh, a couple of months ago, there was talk of the Boris bounce. Private investment may pick up. Growth in the economy could pick up. There's a clearer way forward, less Brexit uncertainty and so on. Now we're looking at a danger to small businesses going bust and to jobs being lost. Yeah, I think this, the, the core budget he wanted to deliver has been blown out of the water by the coronavirus budget. And I think for small businesses, the future can wait, frankly. They've got, a, you know, this is clearly a public health emergency, but it's also a life and death situation for some small businesses. And the key is cash, cash, cash. Things like, for example, will I have to pay my VAT on time? What about my business rates bill? What about employees who are now uh, getting statutory sick pay from day one rather than day four. We've had that announcement. Who's going to pay for that? And eking out the cash over the next few weeks and months will be priority number one for small businesses. And they'll be looking for things like VAT holidays, business rate deferrals, tax deferrals, tax deferral, perhaps some sort of hardship fund. There are lots of businesses where, you know, are self-employed. They don't count as employees, how are you going to, um, you know, how are you going to cater for them if they have to self-isolate? So I think, you know, cash, cash, cash will be the focus for businesses throughout this afternoon. Uh, as you're all saying, this budget's taking place now against the backdrop of the coronavirus. Uh, it's, it's almost overwhelming everything else uh, at the moment. So let's get an update on what's happening there, of course, with the dramatic news that our health minister has now gone down with it. Let's go to Hugh Pym, uh, our health uh, editor. What's the latest there, Hugh? Well, on Nadine, Doris, Andrew, we're still waiting for a, more of a timeline and, and a factual account of what happened. Uh, she was, of course, at a Downing Street reception last Thursday, hosted by the Prime Minister. It's not totally clear when she became unwell. Certainly by Friday she wasn't feeling well. But what then happened over the weekend in her constituency and so on, it's not clear. Then on Monday uh, she said she was self-isolating by then. Uh, and tested at some stage on Tuesday. Clearly, there's a lot uh, of questions that haven't been answered there. And in terms of contact tracing, what Public Health England do is they come in and trace people who've been in close contact. That's uh, two metres or less for more than 15 minutes. So there could have been a meeting at the Department of Health with an official, a meeting with other ministers, including Matt Hancock, uh, other meetings uh, around Westminster. Only those will be advised by Public Health England to basically report any symptoms which might lead to self-isolation. Certainly there's no question of any tests going on right across Whitehall or Westminster at the moment. There's a strict protocol. If you have symptoms, if you've been in contact with someone who's tested positive, then you call 111 and are maybe advised to self-isolate pending a possible test. You certainly know it's come to the heart of government. I think we can say that. The government knows what the crisis is all about at first hand. Is there any sign yet of the government departing from its current strategy, which has been a kind of steady-as-she-goes strategy, very different from the Italian or even the French, where a number of schools have been closed? We've seen sporting events cancelled on the continent. We've watched uh, thousands of people at Cheltenham races. Is it still the same strategy, or are there signs that it's going to change? Well, as of now, Andrew, it is the same strategy. It is containment. But we are, I think, on the cusp of a change. There's a COBRA meeting this afternoon, another one tomorrow involving the Prime Minister. There could be a change of mood tomorrow. But I think only flagging up what they might do. What they say is other countries are doing it in their way here. They want to weigh up the social cost. If you suddenly, say, play every football match behind closed doors, that is a very big intervention, and if people go to the pub to watch on a screen there, they're just as vulnerable as they would be at the stadium. And once you play that card or you close schools, then if it doesn't appear to have much of an impact and the caseload goes on up, people lose confidence and you have real problems there. So they're just weighing up very delicately what the best approach is, but it may be that we're not far off a move to 
su more substantial interventions. I think there will be guidance later this week towards older people who are more vulnerable, whether they should avoid going out and going into crowded public areas. But certainly we'll learn more, I think, over the next 48 hours. Yupin Broadcasting House, thanks for joining us, giving us an update on the latest there. Faisal, let me come back to you. When you were speaking last, we were floating some pictures of the Chancellor and the Governor of the Bank of England talking. We just got these pictures. It's a visual sign of the coordination that is going on. Now, before this budget, you were talking about these monetary measures. The interest rate cut is the most visible. Everybody understands that. It may also be the least important in some, in some ways. Tell us more about the kind of funding the bank is making available to the banks, hoping it will go to small businesses. So this is key. Once you get down to interest rates this low, it is more difficult for the banking sector to pass on those interest rate cuts. And this is what this is about, as Simon was saying. It's about giving uh, the certainty of cash, cash flow, uh, overdrafts from the banking system into businesses that may have lost their customers, their suppliers, their staff might not be here. This is what we're talking about on the ground. So the banking system gets a set of subsidised funding on the condition that this money goes into the real economy, essentially. There's a conditionality uh, attached to it. It was tried out just after the EU referendum. It worked then. This version of it is extra earmarked for small and medium-sized enterprises too. The purpose of this is to pass on the half percent rate cut to those small businesses. You also have this situation where you have safety buffer funds for banks that they hold back. They were very low during the financial crisis. They've been built up so that the banking system is padded up. And for can a stand a, a stress attack. For a situation like this, frankly, they were claiming this for the possibility of no deal Brexit. Um, now they're deploying some of this flexibility that they've built up, some of this padding, so that the economy can be supported. But it requires the banking system to play ball. I think that they will. But then it requires individual bank managers to talk to individual businesses. You know, we had an example, you know, take the Heathrow numbers, which showed that they were 5% down on passengers. Now, a big company can probably handle cash flow for a couple of months. But what about their second tier, third tier suppliers? Are they going to keep on staff through the system? Other interventions have required treasuries around the world. You know, the Irish Treasury is funding sick pay at 300 euros a week for two weeks. That would be a massive cost in the UK. I'm not sure we're going to get that here today. We're relying on employers to pay the sick pay. But, um, but yes. But I see the, the Royal Bank of Scotland. I think we now have to call it NatWest, don't yep. we? Yep. Uh, because Scotland had <laughs> nothing to do. No, no. There was no such thing as RBS. Change the name. It had nothing to do with the great crash of 2008. Uh, they're now talking about um, deferring mortgage payments and debt servicing as well. That's the kind of thing that we'll be looking for on a bigger scale to help businesses through this coronavirus crisis? Yeah, and it's kind of preemptive as well. So you're sort of, you're, you're getting this in before the impact really hits. So you're trying to provide confidence for those marginal decisions. There's a small business owner thinking, can I keep this person on? through a two-month lull yes. in bookings at my being. But there's no money coming in. Yeah, I mean, you just have to go on the streets and see that people are acting more cautiously. Laura? It's interesting. I think overall, the Bank of England and the government are trying basically to inflate a giant set of airbags before we hit a real crash. So all of these measures, if you put them together and the Treasury will come forward with its own in the budget, it's about anticipating the fact this may be extremely serious. But also worth saying briefly, officials in some different government departments have said to me this week that they are calling on a lot of the contingency planning that was done for the possibility of leaving the EU without a deal. So in a sense, some of this is sort of familiar territory for for the government of late. Because we might get our money's worth after all. Well, a lot of money was spent on that <laughs> planning. And some of the things that might happen, actually, whether it's, you know, guarding supply chains, some of the things that might become real pinch points might be the things that were actually planned for already. We've got a lot to talk about with our panel. We'll be back more. It's just coming up to 11.30 now. Let me tell you uh, how we're planning out the day. Uh, we'll go over to the House of Commons at noon uh, and we'll take Prime Minister's questions as user, usual. We <coughs> then think that uh, we'll come out of PMQs and almost go straight into the budget. Uh, the budget will be, we guess, roughly about an hour long and then we will do the post-budget analysis and it'll take us through to 3 o'clock this afternoon. So plenty of time and plenty to talk about. Let's go now to France. 
Francis O'Grady uh, of the Trade Union Congress and Mike Cherry from the Federation of Small Businesses. Francis O'Grady, let me come to you first. What are you looking from? You've heard us talking about the problems that the coronavirus could cause for people, particularly self-employed, particularly those in the gig economy, those that don't have major benefits to fall back on. What would you like to see? Well, we need emergency cash for business, but we need emergency cash for working families too. Uh, the government made a big move in response to trade union pressure to introduce sick pay from day one on a temporary basis uh, only. But what we need to do now is make sure that those two million people who don't earn enough to qualify for statutory sick pay don't end up going to work when they shouldn't because they can't afford to stay home and self-isolate. Uh, and £94.25 a week, that's not going to last many people for long uh, when they've got bills to pay and families to raise. So we need serious interventions from the government on this for the sake of public health, but also to make sure that we keep key parts of the economy running. Uh, there are many cleaners in the NHS who earn very little pay on outsourced contracts. There are workers, care workers in old people's homes, a particularly vulnerable group, uh, again, on very low pay. They have to have decent sick pay in order that they can do the right thing and follow uh, government medical advice. What should the government do for the uh, workers in the gig economy? Well, this is a deep-rooted problem. As you'll know, the TUC and unions have been arguing for years that we need every worker to be entitled to guaranteed hours and fair pay for the decent jobs that they do. Uh, so this rise of insecure working, including zero-hours contracts, is now, I think, all too clear. Um, bad for us all because we end up with this two-tier workforce. Right. Where well, we know the problem... Uh, yeah. but there's both a well, long-term problem but an immediate short-term problem well, because of the like coronavirus. The what what, what should the these, government do? What would you should, like to see it do? They should be uh, changing people's rights at work to ensure that everybody has the right to guaranteed hours, notification of shifts, to be treated fairly and decently and paid at least the real living wage. And of course we do also have this issue of now millions of people uh, who are self-employed, um, many of them by choice, some of them not by choice because employers are putting them on those contracts to strip them of sick pay and holiday rights. Uh, but what we do need is a contingency plan from the government to say that they'll be able to claim universal credit is frankly um, just not real when there's a five-week wait to get any money. OK, Francis O'Grady, thank you for that from the TUC. Let's go to business time. Uh, Mike Cherry, a lot of his members, small businesses. Uh, Mike, I guess it's the small businesses as they're, uh, a, a lot of them surviving week by week or month by month. When their cash flow dries up or is seriously reduced, they're in trouble. They are indeed, and we've already seen costs increasing, uh, both with the increase in the national living wage due to come in next month, uh, increased rate, rents, and rates coming through next month and what we've been calling on the government is the increase in the employers allowance uh, which has already been trailed the increase from three thousand to four thousand pounds to help offset some of these costs which is to be very welcome but uh, whilst statutory sick pay from day one is the right thing to do it's not that long ago that the smallest of businesses were unable to recover their statutory sick pay and we've been urgently lobbying the government to try and ensure that that option comes back in. We hope that announcement will be made in the budget, even if it's just for a short-term measure. But of course, one of the big things here is, as you've already been hearing, is cash. And business rates are a regressive anti-growth tax that you pay out before you even open the door, let alone turn over your first pound or make any profit. So help to alleviate the increase in business rates and indeed deferring the payment of business rates would be a major help okay. to small businesses along with banks deferring payments on overdrafts and loans perhaps. All right. So we very let, let much me, hold, on, hold on, hold on. I just wanted an answer to the question, not a speech. So but let me come back to you. Your organisation has got its ear to the ground. Are you already seeing signs of distress among small businesses as a result of the virus? 
Not necessarily distress as yet, but we are hearing of many businesses where they're having problems with supply chains, so whether it be raw materials, whether it be parts coming in to be able to complete whatever it is that they manufacture or provide to their customers. And of course, in the retail side, we're already beginning to see the uh, decrease in footfall, which of course is having an impact on turnover. So again, that is becoming apparent. Obviously, business is following the advice that the uh, scientists and the health uh, department is pushing out. And we do need to see this cash uh, coming through to businesses very, very quickly indeed, right. if this does take hold in the next two weeks as it's forecast. All right, Mike Cherry for the Federation of Small Businesses, thanks for joining us. Now, Simon, what you saw there was from both the TUC and the Federation of Small Businesses using the coronavirus crisis to push their own agendas. That's what the Chancellor is having to do with. Well, I mean, the, you know, you had the TUC saying, oh, we want to change all the rules here. Mm -hmm. Small businesses saying, oh, we, we want business rates reformed and so on. I mean, it's no secret that business rates has been a bugbear <laughs> for businesses for years. Long before and the, the virus. And the, long before I think even Mike Cherry was working <laughs> but, at the FSB. But don't but, miss an opportunity to but, lobby for it. What they do hope is that uh, this may be today, if they do say there can be some sort of business rate holiday, and it's complex because a lot of this money goes to local authorities, um, whether they can, well, this could be the catalyst for a change. Right, or a let few, me Yes. Sorry, we've just got the Chancellor uh, coming out of uh, number 11 Downing Street uh, a little while ago. We've got that. If we've got the video of Taylor, I should just have kept with Simon, you see, Simon. <laughs> we interrupted you for no purpose whatsoever. <laughs> just wanted to go Let's back. the Chancellor's more efficient. <laughs> well, just going back to the point you were making about the, ba the, the banks and getting this money through to small businesses, I think some of those uh, measures you, we saw yesterday from the RBSs and Barclays mm. of this world saying that there can, can be mortgage holidays. Now, I think that is important, really, because, you know, for the self-employed, your household finances and your business finances are one and the same thing. Mm -hmm. so, in, so individual uh, holidays for consumers could be a way of getting to those hard-to-reach bits of the economy. So I think the forbearance, which the Bank of England has been talking to the high street banks for several days about now, are a really key part of how to get some assistance through the, the to those small businesses. What are renters, you see? I mean, yeah. I mean the, yeah. the, what would you do about yeah. the, who tend to be less financially mm. uh, able to deal with shocks? And so we think of things in terms of mortgage rates all the time. Yeah. And it's obviously typically... How oh, so I now get to interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there he is. But this time for a purpose. Because there is the, the Chancellor and his team coming out of uh, 11 Downing Street, or as some people now call it, 10A Downing Street, because we've always thought that uh, <laughs> the number 10's fingerprints are all over this budget. Uh, one of the reasons why Sajid Javid is not the man holding this box uh, right now. It's the budget red box. It's not Mr Gladstone's famous red box. That's uh, had more wear and tear than it could withstand. Uh, but there he is. It's uh, a lot on the, this young man's shoulders. 39 years old, MP for a northern Yorkshire rural constituency. He was Chief Secretary to the Treasury under Sajid Javid for his brief period. And here he is holding up his uh, famous red budget box. Now, I think this budget could be so big that he may have to have a second box to get some of the other measures into it uh, at the moment. But uh, it's a big day for this young chancellor. Been in situ for less than a month. Laura, some thoughts as we watch this? You just have to wonder what's going through his head. Indeed. Because it's not just his first day. This is also the first budget since we've left the European Union. It's also the first budget for this government since yes. they won an enormous majority. And in, in either of those regards, on their own, it would be an enormous day. But now I'm thinking of the moment when we saw Alistair Darling come out with his budget box right. at that moment at the height of in the 2009. Crash. And nobody quite knew what was in there, but there is that sense. Now everybody hopes that the impacts of coronavirus will be temporary, mm. but there is this great sense of uncertainty. You know, just in terms of the spreadsheets that would have been produced by the Office of Budget Responsibility and the Treasury a few weeks ago to put this budget together are all completely and utterly out of date. Mm. And it's just a reminder of how much the political landscape is may well be changed by this for a long, long time. And as you say, it's on his shoulders. A brand new chancellor, well rated, well respected, definitely background in finance. His way up. Background in finance, but what a step up! My goodness. Okay. Oh, with these words probably ringing in his ears. <laughs> so no that pressure. There's absolutely no pressure on him whatsoever. Let's go over to College Green and Vicky Young. Vicky.
That's right, Andrew. And as you're saying there, really a chancellor that we didn't expect dealing with a public health crisis. We didn't expect what's he going to come up with uh, with solutions. And also the longer term, he can't let go of all of that. He has some very ambitious plans. Let's discuss this a little bit more. I'm joined by the Conservative MP uh, Kevin Hollenrake and Labour's Alison uh, McGovern. First of all, levelling up, it was the result of the general election, the Conservatives, people voting for the Tories, in some cases for the first time. What is Rishi Sunak going to have to do to really encourage those people to vote Conservative again? Well, it's great to have a Yorkshire MP delivering the budget and what better place, what better person. But um, this is about opportunity being equally spread throughout the UK. We know that talent is equally spread, but people in the north, particularly, I would say, are not given the opportunities that some people in the south and the southeast have. So it's about spending more money on our transport infrastructure. It's also about a better deal in terms of education, healthcare, local services. So we're looking to see all those things hopefully delivered in today's budget. And Alison, that's presumably something that Labour could get behind. Do you know, I am sick of these slogans from Tory chancellors that end up not meaning anything. And, you know, we've seen with HS2 that great big train lines that, you know, Tory MPs shout about from the dispatch box actually don't get us very far. When it comes to giving opportunity to people in places that haven't had it, the consequences of 10 years of a Tory government are all around us. People just need to go into their town centre, you know, like people from the Wirral do. They go into Birkenhead and they see the consequences of a Tory government all around us. So that's the test for the Chancellor today. It's about will what he announces shut down these food banks that we have everywhere? Will what he announces stop the rough sleeping that is caused by withdrawal of support for people with addictions? You know, unless he does those things, he can build as many train lines as he wants, you know, that will open 10 or 20 years in the future. But people want action to change our economy now. And never, you know, we had Northern Powerhouse. Where's that now? We had long-term economic plan. That's gone nowhere, hasn't it? This is just another one of them This slogans. is the point, isn't it? Because we're talking about investment, <clears throat> billions and billions of pounds for investment. That's building roads, rail, all the rest of it. But day-to-day -day spending is a different issue, isn't it? Those cuts to councils, cuts to other sectors as well. Is he going to do anything about that? Uh, Alison talks about slogans. The get Brexit doesn't meant something. We promised to do that. We delivered on it. We've also promised to well, level up. It absolutely does mean something. Alison says, what's happened to Northern Powerhouse? You look at that budget today, I'm very confident we're talking about half a trillion pounds of infrastructure spending. That's, that's what just, we'll level up. what about day-to-day -day spending? Day -to -day, of course, we've got to be fiscally conservative, we've got to be careful, it's his taxpayers' money. But one well, thing we absolutely promised to do in the manifesto was to make sure people on the lowest incomes kept more of what they're well, earning. It's absolutely the right thing to do. No, we need to fund public the, services the, better. The Tories, yes, we do. The Tories and we need to, need to level benefit. right the money off is going into the health service. The Tories nonsense. tax cuts have benefited benefit those, have benefited those the with top more. Top 1% has paid a higher yeah. proportion of tax but, than but, at any but, time under, a, under your Labour administration. But the point is... Actually, if you look at the consequences of the past 10 years of Tory government, even by their own standards, ticket prices on trains up by 42% whilst they've held down uh, the, the fuel tax that benefits people who drive big cars. Look at what happened with Crossrail 2 being built for London rather than infrastructure in the north. They could have started, they could have started big railway infrastructure projects in the north. 10 years ago and they've chosen not to. The ones they did do in Manchester, the rail hub project went really badly and we had rail delays for years. Would you be in favour year of more year borrowing year. for day-to-day -day spending? We will end up with more borrowing for day-to-day -day spending as a result of coronavirus, as a result of the failure that we've seen of a Tory government. You know, you talked, Vicky, about... Um, about councils and what they're having to deal with. Those cuts have been totally ineffective because they've caused so many problems. What I would say is that we need a proper plan that responds to the crisis that we're in now, that says, OK, our economy is going to change because of Brexit and other things. How do we fight coronavirus economically and make sure that people can get through it financially, as well as set in train and just finally in the on medium term sound that finances. will rebalance our economy? Some of your colleagues are worried about too much borrowing to spend? I think most of my colleagues are comfortable if the borrowing is to invest. There's different types of spending, recurrent spending, day-to-day -day spending and investment spending. Uh, Alison's choosing to make this party political. Leveling up should not be party political. It has been decades of underinvestment in the regions of Labour government and Conservative government. We need to move forward, invest and improve everybody's prospects wherever they are in the UK. OK, we're going to have to leave it there. This debate will, as we know, go on and on. Uh, Kevin Honoré and Alison McGovern, thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And we'll see what the Chancellor has in store very soon.
Thanks, Vicky. Well, you can see the debate about the budgets are already underway, even though we have not yet had the budget. It's still about, let me check, the clock's about 45 minutes away. So let's go to Simon McCoy. He's in Wakefield. Andrew, thank you very much. Yes, I'm at the Trinity Walk shopping centre here. You've heard from the politicians. But what do people locally want? It's cash. It's more power locally. I've got four people to talk to me about the various issues. Uh, Kayleigh Hignall is from Citizens Advice. Uh, Vicky Smith is an events organiser. She works for Wakefield Mumbler. That's a local business. Uh, Edel Christie is managing director at Ar Arcadis. That's a local business. She's also part of Northern, the Northern Powerhouse Partnership. And Margaret Wood, who's founder of ICW. That's a specialist window manufacturer. I'll be with you in just a moment, uh, Margaret, but Kayleigh, first of all, it, the budget, traditionally, everybody's waiting for the chance to get up on his feet, but your phones, I suspect, are already ringing that's, because of coronavirus. That's right. For example, we've seen three times as many visits to our sick pay pages on our web page because people are clearly confused and concerned about how they're going to cover the cost if they do need to self-isolate or stay at home follow advice. And what we want from the budget today is to make sure people don't face that impossible choice of having to stay at work so that they can pay their bills, put food on the table, or follow that advice and, uh, and uh, self-isolate. We've had the interest rate cut already announced today. It's all about cash flow, is it? That's right. I mean, this is a really welcome move, but we do need to think about individuals here as well. So cash flow for individuals involves access to sick pay. And there are 5 million self-employed people who can't get it, as well as 1.5 million people who don't earn enough to also get it. So we do want to see the government widening the pool of people who can get it, making sure it's enough to pay and supporting businesses to cover the costs of that. I mean, Vicky, you already work from home, so that's not an issue for you. But once events get cancelled, that's going to be a problem. Well, we're seeing what hap what's happening at the moment and we'll be working um, uh, as, as, as long as we can do up until the summer and working as normal. But you're working with a lot of parents, I know. What, what's their concern? So in terms of coronavirus, it's everyone's just working as normal at the moment. I do think there are some concerns of what happens when children are at home and you're trying to look after, pair, look after children plus work from home for, say, 14 days of self-isolation when you've got children climbing the walls and not knowing what to do with them. And Edel, in terms of what the Chancellor might announce, what are you really hoping for? I guess if you're looking at it from a business perspective, what we're really hoping is that he will be making some concessions in terms of perhaps VAT or business rates to really help businesses work through this COVID period. Yeah, and Margaret, you're nodding your head there, but you have a much more immediate problem, especially as window manufacturer, as I said. Your main supplier is from... We have component parts from Italy, just outside Milan, so we obviously can't get them at the moment. So, so what's the situation right now for you? It's, it's not too bad. We've had to look at resourcing that, and I think a lot of our customers now are looking to do that back into the UK. So that could be an opportunity, particularly for the supply chain, because our customers are nationwide, so they have been hit by the supply chain as well. So. Uh, it's just dealing with it as we go along and hopefully the government will um, recognise the impact of coronavirus which is happening already, particularly with the Bank of England and we get that investment to reassure people because this is about homes and communities and most importantly it's about people and people having that income. So Edel, what will people be looking for from the Chancellor specifically in terms of cash? Uh, in terms of COVID specifically, mm. I think in terms of, well, we talked about people, right? So that citizens generally in the UK need to know that they've got certainty about how they're going to work through this. But businesses, and I think Margaret makes a really important point, there's a full supply chain of, of companies that are all connected together. And in terms of how we want to keep productivity moving in this country through COVID-19, the cash concessions that will come through, as say, taxes or VAT, to really help all the supply chain managers through that. And what about the wider issues of corporation tax, uh, business rates, are these things that also you're hoping are addressed? Absolutely. I mean, we're here on a high street today and all of these shop owners and these businesses 
are really hoping that if we do have people stopping come through, how are they going to work through that period? And those concessions and business rate reductions will be really important in that period. Kayleigh, I was talking to a business lady a moment ago who was saying that actually shoplifting is a big problem. There aren't the police, that there, there are much wider issues affecting problems on the high street like this. Well, yeah, I mean, if you look at life, it's never just one thing, right? So if we think about the 2.7 million people we help at Citizens Advice across the country, people come into us about all sorts of things. It can be about paying your gas bill, it can be about whether your benefits are right and being able to access quick financial support, and it can be about problems they face on the high street as well. So people are really day to day facing quite severe challenges already, even before we look at what the impact of coronavirus might be. Now, Vicky, let's on any normal day we'd be talking about issues like well, big issues like HS2. Is, mm. is that something that will make a big difference to, to Wakefield? Do you think? Um, personally, um, HS2 for Wakefield, no. Um, uh, I think it'll, if it does, the second part of it does happen, it will benefit Leeds, but um, Wakefield's got a quick train route already down to London within two hours. Um, so Wakefield people would have to travel to Leeds to get on HS2 to go back. So we're going back on ourselves. And you're nodding away. Yeah, well, I, probably, probably a different opinion. Um, I think HS2 is a once in a generation opportunity. But what's also important is the commitment to look at high speed north as well at the same time and really look at the connectivity across these cities that goes from Liverpool to Newcastle and connect these cities up to Scotland, down to the Midlands and down to London. And, I've got to leave it there, but I hope we'll talk later on and we'll see what you make of what the Chancellor actually has to say when he eventually does get to his feet. So a mixed view, but obviously, as with everywhere else, Andrew, the priority at the moment is how to deal with this crisis over coronavirus. Back to you. Indeed it is, Simon. Thanks uh, for that. We're getting reports that the Treasury was deep cleaned overnight uh, before the budget. You may think that happens all the time, but it doesn't. Apparently, uh, an official's partner tested positive for the coronavirus, but the official uh, themselves doesn't have the virus, but is self-isolating anyway. And uh, Treasury officials have been told that they can work from home if they want, which probably means they're at home now watching us. So, hello, Treasury officials. <laughs> Put your feet up, because we're going to tell you about Johnsonomics. Is there such a thing? I'm not so sure myself. But uh, take a look at this. Billions of pounds. Two billion pounds more. 3.6 billion. We want to turbocharge. Boris Johnson says he wants to turbocharge the economy. But when it comes to the gritty detail of what that all means, we've still got much to learn. Which begs the question. What is Johnsonomics? Johnsonomics. Johnsonomics. Johnson Economics. Did I get that wrong? Johnsonomics. OK. Early indications are that this is a Prime Minister Kipper. ready to spend. Boost, boost, boosting. On the NHS, police, transport. He's also seduced by major infrastructure projects. Infrastructure revolution. Now he's in number 10, he wants to enhance his reputation as Boris the Builder. Behold this brick. And there's a new catchphrase. We need now to level up, level up, level up, level up, leveling up. Leveling up means that everybody feels that they benefit from this economic boom that they feel left them untouched. And it's not just spreading the wealth and certainly not through the tax system, but spreading opportunity, spreading the sense of ambition. He told his cabinet he sees himself as a Brexity Hezer. I'm Michael Heseltine. I've been around a long time. Is that enough? Following in the footsteps of the man who believed in state intervention to revive neglected regions such as Liverpool in the 1980s, all inspired by the idea of one nation conservatism. It's not a question of throwing money at problems, it's a question of the transformation in the way this country is governed. What I want to know is how he intends to do it. He loves things that uh, are actually lasting, that are uh, transformative, that can change lives and cost a lot of money, but they are genuinely an investment. The Cabinet has given high-speed rail the green signal. The slogans of politicians in elections are a very long way from the reality of what you have to do if you're going to govern a country in a one-nation context. Would you welcome a phone call from him if he asked for your advice? <laughs> Let's live in the real world. The more the Prime Minister wishes to level up, though, the more he'll have to spend. So will he relax the government's fiscal rules to borrow more? Borrowing is very cheap at the moment, and I think Boris will be 
uh, very aware that now is as good a time as any to borrow if you're using the money to invest. All the indications are that this is going to be a borrowing government. I'm a bit of a skeptic for someone who says you can just borrow your way out of trouble. Gerard Lyons, my economic advisor, sitting in the second row, trying to avoid my eye. Boris Johnson has very good political antennae, but he is effectively a journalist, a politician and a classicist. He's not a macroeconomist or a financial expert. Boris is very keen to actually listen to advice. So what are the experts likely to advise him when it comes to his tax policy? He does advocate low taxation, but he would not advocate low taxation, I would say, above everything else. He certainly thinks that the state should take as little of an individual's money as possible. But he has to counter that with his desire to spend money on things that only the state can do. So, Johnsonomics, what's their verdict? Johnsonomics, so far, has been a general election strategy. We see a massive commitment to spend more money and a very considerable concentration of that money on the North. I don't think it's possible to define Johnsonomics just yet. If one looks back at Thatcherism, Thatcherism evolved over her time in office. What would Maggie do? Johnsonomics, to me, is a curious but fascinating combination of Thatcherite good housekeeping with Keynesian ambitions to sort of uh, spend huge amounts of money on things that only government can do. There you are, Johnsonomics, such as it is. The uh, Sun is reporting that fuel duty will be frozen for the 10th year in a row. Indeed, it's not just reporting that, it's crowing it, because saying it's won its campaign. Uh, we don't know if that's true or not, but I guess the Sun wouldn't really be reporting it if it didn't think that it, it had won that. Now, let, let's look at uh, what was said there. The Johnsonomics there, which is a terrible phrase, was, was talked about in terms of infrastructure. Uh, and, of course, that's part of it. Yes. Uh, but I would say there's another part, too, which wasn't covered, which what I would call a kind of blue-collar conservatism. So it, it prioritises taking people out of national insurance rather than cutting the marginal rate income taxes of high earners. Mm -hmm. It prioritises rises in the minimum wage rather than balancing current spending. That's just as important to this project as investment. It is because aside from the economic detail there is a political ambition that Boris Johnson holds to permanently change the political map mm -hmm. and either bring back Conservative voters who might have voted for Margaret Thatcher during her landslides, but then sort of fell away. That working class sort of pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of Tory. Essex man, it used to be called. Exactly, Essex man. But he wants Essex man. He wants County Durham man. He wants <laughs> Wakefield man. He wants Yorkshire man. Too. And even the odd woman. Even the odd woman. Although interestingly, there is a bit of a gap in terms of how the genders, different genders, support uh, Boris Johnson's party. But he wants to create a sense where people who voted Tory for the first time, or maybe for the first time in a long time, feel that they've got something to show for it in their pocket and from what they can see in their town or their city, in their village, by the time of the next general election. And I think it was interesting there that there wasn't really agreement on what Johnsonomics may be, which is actually, I think, two things. Firstly, it's too early to say, and it's not really ideological, because he's not really an ideological kind of politician. I covered the first Thatcher budget, mm. Done then by a programme called Nationwide. It's good. With Sue well, Lolly. Sorry, yeah. 1979. Nobody talked about Thatcherism in the first uh, Geoffrey Howe uh, budget. What I would suggest, though, when you look at this, is that business cannot be so sure that in every area this is the kind of pro business Tory government it might have been expecting. I think that is an understatement, actually. <laughs> um, I'm famous I, for that. I, isn't I, <laughs> I think that the relationship between this Conservative government and business has been very, very different than it enjoyed during you know, the, the Heseltine years, the Thatcher years, etc. And there is a suspicion in some parts of government of the corporatist nature of business mm. and that it's actually not, you know, it, the, the, the benefits of the 10 year expansion we've seen have uh, been un unevenly shared out. They don't want to see that and therefore the free market freewheeling free market economics with little state intervention I think that model's gone out of the window and this is a very different kind of relationship now what I was speaking to some business leaders the other day and what they're hoping is that this coronavirus situation which is dominating the, the headlines today and you know dominating this budget will be a moment they're calling for working groups to get together for experts to get back involved mm. despite what Michael Gove said during the during the, the referendum and uh, this is an opportunity Opportunity for them saying we know how to help you fix this bring us back inside the tent a tent that they felt outside for a long time
Fine, so the other change is that I mean, for almost the past 10 years, budgets have been dominated by borrowing debt, the deficit, and the need to get that down as the government saw it and so did others. Uh, that's almost going out the window now, I would suggest. The, def the size of the deficit suddenly no longer seems to be so important. The Financial Times this morning, a Treasury briefing saying latest government thinking will reflect the latest international thinking. Well, the IMF, the OECD, other international bodies are now saying at a time of very ultra low interest rates, deficits don't matter so much. And the presumption is not just that they are low, but they will stay low for some time. Yes. But they have been low for some time as well. So that's a big call. Uh, and we don't even want to think about if that call is wrong. Let's assume that it's right. This big infrastructure plan, and it is big, um, you've got to try and define what levelling up means. They don't really want to define it. Indeed, the Chancellor said at the weekend that it's about feeling that things weren't going right for your area and for your region. But does it mean levelling up incomes? I don't think it does. Does it mean levelling up even levels of public investment? A bit. But if they really were to use the education spending definition of levelling up, which is a, a per capita definition by school, if you were to try to apply that to transport spending, I think you're talking like 40 billion extra and a bonanza for the East Midlands and for the South West to bring it up to London levels. Are we implicitly saying... This is quite profound, this, that London has got too much investment. I'm going because to let that question yeah. hang in there because we have to go over to the Commons for Prime Minister's questions. My duties in the House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Mr. Speaker.